Gretchen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Tell us all about empathetic testing. It's a, it's a mouthful to say, to say it five times now. You know, um, I, uh, I, I used to live here in Albuquerque. I lived here for um, a total of 11 years over two different occasions. Um, I was uh, the archaeologist at Pepper Cliff National Monument for seven years, um, several years ago. And um, I finished up part of my career working out of Santa Fe. Um, I used to go back and forth between Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and I worked up there in the National Trails Office. So, um, I spent most of my career in either as an interpreter where I talked to people or as um, a resource manager where I took care of the resources in the park that I was in. And then I, I went back to San Diego a few years ago, which is where I'm from originally, and I got really into episode of cacti, like over my, like obsessively. Um, I had, at one point, I had 700 plants in my collection. And when I left San Diego to come back there, both my kids are still here, and my husband and I decided to retire back here. Um, I, I had to give them all away or whatever. As it, it, it turns out, though, I took about 200 with me. Um, most of them right now are sticks and pots because, like this box down here in front, I brought them mostly as cuttings. And I brought a few plants that were big enough that that's where the cuttings came from, were the big plants that I brought with me. And they're not all in the greatest of shape right now because. You know, moving in a trailer from San Diego to here in December last year was not easy on them, on them but, we, but we survived. So, um, without any further ado, I'll get started here. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history, not much. Um, I'm a cultural resource person, so I could go crazy and give you two hours on it, so I won't. Um, cacti, what are they? A little bit about the hybrids and the bird species. I have both of them I have in my collection now and previously. Um, although I had to have friends in San Diego send me a bunch of things that I couldn't quite get into the truck. You know, it's only so much room. Um, uh, how to grow them and make them bloom, and that was a question I had. You know, because how do we get these things to bloom? They are a little bit tougher to handle here in our drier environment than they do in San Diego, which is, although desert like at times, it's a Mediterranean climate, but and it has a higher humidity generally year round. So, of course, they do better there. They need the humidity. So you have to kind of help them along. And then I'll talk a little bit about along with how to make them bloom, some of the things on soil, and then the fertilizer itself. Hopefully I don't talk too much about that. Uh, the uh, epiphyllums, or epiphyllums, whichever way you want to say it, that the word in Greek means a homily. Because when these were first found in Latin America, they both from mostly Mexico, South America, the northern part of South America, and um, some of the Caribbean. There's actually two. One that grows, uh, well, there's a type of root foliage that grows in uh, Madagascar, and there's another one in Sri Lanka. But those are the only two that do not bloom or grow in Latin America. The, uh, or from there. As early as the 1600s, maybe into the 1500s, when the, the Spanish first came into Mexico, we see that these were being collected and they were being sent back to Europe. Yes. Isn't there just one species that doesn't grow in Latin America and can fly around by birds? Is it a reptile? Well, that's that's what this one. And no, there's 72 of these. There's two of them. No, 72. 72. Right, but isn't there only one that? Yes, that's the Madagascar one and the one in Asia. In right, I think one of them, right? Yeah, I know they're two different ones. Oh, okay. Because yeah. a lot of what I read before is there's only one. Well, there's, there's okay. There's two places where they're found, and whether or not they're the same species okay. is, is a debate. Um, anyway, they were collected and into Europe as early as the 1600s, maybe a little bit before. But by the 1800s, they were being hybridized pretty consistently. And this includes also the, like the uh, holiday cactus, the Clematis. They were also being um, done, and that's an epithetic cacti. And I'll mention those as we go. And they are very complex. Their history, so their ancestry has not been well reported. We report it pretty well now because we have a registry of, of hybrids. And, but there, in previous times, they weren't, but they're very complex crossings and back crossings, etc. This is an early um, depiction from a, a drawing. Uh, you can see here, this is, um, a, it, we now call it uh, Dysopactus chronotis. And then this one from 1844, the drawing. And this drawing from 1830, this is Dysopactus acromaniae. 
they've been recently reorganized. They used to be called up a pile of now they're like um, these are two early hybrids. I have both of these in my collection. Uh, London I did, and they, they did these kind of quasi-scientific names back in the 1800s. So you have London I and you have Acromani I hybridus. And um, but nowadays the, the registry folks may give them names that are less scientific, pseudo-scientific names. But um, those are those those are two early ones, and I, I do have um, both of those. Um, these are two that were used, um, if I go back, to make uh, Acromonii hybridus. The, the species that were crossed was Dicocactus speciosus and Dicocactus chlorophyllis. And this one here is called, or is called um, Deutsche Kaiserin by many people. Yeah, some people in the states call them um, Turin Empress, but I like to go with the actual name that it was given originally, which is Deutsche, Deutsche Kaiserin. And um, this one might actually even be the species. But it's all the records, there's not good records, but it, it's a very um, unique plant and it's been used a lot in hybridization. So, what are they? Well, uh, Myron Kinnock wrote in the early, one of the, our, the previous editions of the species of epiphytic cacti section for the uh, Epiphytal Society of America, which are TV directors. Um, they are better, they're not as well known as terrestrial cacti. The epiphytes, they generally grow in forested areas, perched up in the trees with other epiphytes, such as orchids and lilia, and they or they root, they will root in the ground, but then they have to, some of the species like the um, and this one actually is an epiphyllum, the pomalone. This is a small white flowered one, and it these will have their roots and they'll climb up the tree. And that's how they stabilize them. They are tropical, they're tropical cacti, and, that, and they, they grow on or climb the trees. So that's, that's what makes them epiphytic. They're not parasitic. They grow on it, not off of it. And the trees, like I said, provide the support. There, there, there are also some that grow amongst rocks. They're called cacti. Um, generally speaking, though, we've got, they're either epilithic lipophytes, which then grow on the surface of rocks, or endolithic lipophytes, Grow the crevices of rocks. And these are all in a tropical, generally tropical area. Um, the roots survive on the nutrients in decomposing leaf litter and uh, moss and distant wind blown, wind blown soil where these grow in their, their species where they come from. We put them in, we put them in soil, but our soil should be very well draining and not there's not a whole lot of nutrition that comes from the soil, which is why we typically recommend replacing it every two years just because of the ability to feed the plant. Um, they pull nourishment and moisture out of the air with their air roots. And they originate in all sorts of tropical environments, but they could be subtropical, tropical, they could be dry forests, they could be wet forests, they could be mangroves. They're in, they come in all sorts of different areas. But, and that leads to having a very um, existence for them in what we grow now. Some of these do really well in my yard that is in, in the dry part of the yard. Others of them need a little bit more humidity. And it just depends on what their ancestry is. And you kind of have to move them around in your yard sometimes to find the, the sweet spot for where they do the best. Um, some epi uh, uh, vocabulary, if you will. Um, one of the biggest things is to try to get people to understand is that you're not leaving. These are stems. Branch, the sato, same as any cacti. And so they have um, a mid rib that runs down the middle of the plant. That's the, the avenue for getting all the nutrients out through the veins to the aerial, which is where your flower or your new growth is going to come. Um, we typically talk about them, those of us that are call ourselves um, <laughs> we, 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 uh, we We talk about it in terms of the inner petals. The outer petals and the back petals, and this is how they're described in the registry and the colors and whatnot. And, how to, and they're really hard to identify. It's almost impossible to identify one that's the last tag of the hybrid because they, um, there's so many that look alike. There's, there's close to 15,000 of these in the registry. 
So, um, and it's all about the flowers. You know, we're, we're that, everybody I know that grows these in crazy form like I did, and, and probably will continue to do. Um, you know, this is from my, my backyard in, in, in the Uda. Um, Sonoma, Sunshine, and Perea. Was that in a building or greenhouse? Or did it's just in my yard. I have a shade cover. That's it. I mean, if you're around growing there, shade cover for the summer. You know, it's, it's, it's so, they're so easy. You can have a yeah, you didn't have to work no. hard. Well, I have 700. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, but that's what, yeah. Basically, they kind of grew themselves. And they really, they, they really do that kind of a benign neglect in a way. You know, you give them what they need and then just leave them alone. And then they'll, they do pretty well for you. Um, this is the registry that is current and right now. Uh, the Epiphyton Society of America, which is based out of Los Angeles, is the International Registration Authority for these plants. And like I said, about 15,000 registered. And the neat thing about the registry is it has in the front seat um, a section on epiphytic species. So you can get a good feel for the species as well as the hybrids. It's not pictorial. There's no pictures in this thing. There's too much information in it. But that's what, that's what it is. Yes. Do they all hybridize? It, with the, it depends. The epiphyllums, the true epiphyllums, are really difficult to get to hybridize. There are not very many that have the actual epiphyllum in their ancestry. The dicotactus, uh, they, they they fruit all the time. Yeah, they're they're not hard at all. But so it just it depends, and, and some cross more readily with others than, than others. It's, it's it's kind of a mixed bag that way. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit, and I'll say like we, when you're picking out some from the box here, um, I put on there if it's a large or a small or an extra small or whatever, um, and and these are how they're categorized. And so the flowers. Can be as little as two inches or a little bit less, all the way up to like inner plate size. And I've got one that's an orange one called Goose, and the thing is huge. And unfortunately, I don't have any cuttings. I just brought cuttings of that one, but next year we'll do that. Um, there are 16 epiphytic uh, genera, the, uh, and there's over 200 uh, epiphytic cacti species. Yeah, and the ones that, that I grow primarily. Are the um, Hylocereae. Uh, these are ones that I've had in my collection, although I have had Xenia and I've got some Cypra um, and, of course, uh, the Scombergera, the Scolipsa, and the Celadopsis. Also, I've actually got all these. Yeah, I do understand. Yeah. Well, I know. It's the Uterus, you terrestrial folks. Um, I, I mean, I grow, some, I grow some of those too. So it's like, I'm, I'm totally insane. Sure. Is it a, a red line on the wild thing to show it? Yes, yeah, that when you measure the, the, the flower, you measure from uh, from tip to tip of the, the of the longest or the most wide uh, point in the, in the bloom. Yeah. Yeah. Is there sure. are some ones that have really little bitty flowers that you can barely even see? Yes, yeah, that, that would be these. The, the right, right, yeah. yeah, they've got little. I'll show you here. I've got some. Um, the actual ancestry of, these, uh, of the ones that we call um, epi epi hybrids, um, their ancestry is actually mostly a coral cactus, Selenoceras, and um, Dicocactus. And of the uh, coral cactus, uh, we get uh, hybrids that they call a coral cult. Um, and but these are the right tail captains. You can see, see these for sale every once in a while in the stores. Um, but they, but they are also then hybridized as well. Um, but there's actually like only two in this in this uh, um, these have been crossed with things like these nitro captains. These are the actual species. This is where you get the day blooming and the colorful parts of it. So these are mostly day blooming. Um, and there's 27 different uh, plants in this genus that could be possibly and fairly readily easily crossed with something like the Procaptus or even with the um, Selen. I mean, excuse me, there's, there's some of those. And I've got um, Nelsonii and that's the only one I've got in my collection. 
and then um, and then these are the salinicerus. This is the dragon fruit here. Um, dragon fruit used to be hylocerus. It's recently been split into salinicerus. So uh, all of these have these great big, um, uh, not they're not as colorful, I don't think, as the course of the but um, but they're they're uh, but this one here, this one smells like chocolate. And, and this one's kind of got a vanilla-like scent. And this is the Salinocerus andatus, which used to be called Hylocerus andatus. This is the one that a lot of people have dragon fruit growing in the garden. So, but all of these will produce a fruit and epiphyton fruit, and these fruits are people eat them all. Um, and just to show you how big this flower is on ground floor. I had to borrow that, that, that photo from you and a couple of years. I had to borrow it from you. And these are this is this one sometimes is called King of the Night or Moonlight Cactus. Actually, you know, I, I glossed over, I went to I went to go back I don't know if I just lost that. I missed I missed this slide. That's what that's what threw me. This is what they used to think everything was intended. Everything was lumped together in one group called the Plot. And then when they started splitting these out, you know how with the DNA now, they're able to split these out and see that none of these, for the most part, I think there's only like two instances in the registry where these are listed as the, as the parent. There's nothing really that descends from epiphyllum anymore that they think. Everything now is in dicotyl, for the most part, that used to be in, in epiphyllum. But these you're, are- You're talking about the hybrids now that we- Right, that people have created from these from these species. This is, um, these are night blooming. All of the night, all of the um, epiphyllum, the true epiphyllum species of plants are night blooming. They last like one night and they're gone the next day. And um, kind of like uh, Pruvianus, like that. And Pruvianus gets called Queen of the Night or Night Blooming Purist. And my mother, this is my, this is my mother's plant. This one plant that I had, I cloned of it and kept in my family. And um, she bought this like. I still have it. That's, that, this was my book. This was my book. Um, but but then this is another one. You can tell there's difference in the same numbers. Anyway, but uh, Epiphyllum octopetalum is another one that's called Queen of the Night. So the names, the, the nickname is Brian Crazy. Yeah. What character are they calling it? Uh, Moab. In the wild, most of these are, are the day bloomers, probably any number of different insects, but the night bloomers are not. This is the fruit off of the Salonicerus granophora. If you're familiar with dragon fruit, this is different, but you can see the size of that thing. And then dragon fruit, um, we think of them as, as sweet, and there's three different kinds, three different um, species of dragon fruit from which they now have developed. Loads and loads of hybrids, and a lot of the, the hybrids now are self-feeding, so you don't have to run out in the, in the overnight and can't pollinate everything to get your fruit. Um, this one is one of the hybrids, and a lot of the hybrids, some of these um, have red, red fruit inside, yellow fruit, white. Most of the uh, the old with the species have white fruit, but you can see that the the way that the way that this um, Fruit book versus the one I just showed from the others. So I just noted that the other way I tried to track this earlier. That green line was more than two. Ah, okay, yeah, and I've never, I haven't had to compare that, so that's interesting. But yeah, the megalanthus would be the, the, uh, the, um, the yellow. The yellow. Yeah. So, so what it's really is that it doesn't have some kind of sound like two individual. Right. Um, and, uh, it's, it's good. Oh yeah, uh, some people like them to maybe like a kiwi a little bit taste wise. Um, depends on the variety; it, it varies. But yeah, they, they're 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 fruit. Some are more fruity or more fruity or more sweet than others. The red, the red one. Yeah, the red, the red fruit things like that. Well, 
Well, if, if you were if you were at my meeting in San Diego, where it's where I was president of the society, when the for dragon fruit are blooming, it's on our refreshment table every night. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now you, you may be familiar with papaya, the sour papaya. Um, it, it is a more sour fruit, but the thing that happens is that people have confused papaya with pitahaya. Pitahaya is the salinaceris, a critic cacti. So you see a lot of times people will say, oh, it's a pitahaya, it's a papaya, and so they're, they're confusing it, calling it dragon fruit, but it really is. So, so just, just a kind of a curious thing to have. How do you prepare them? Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, scoop them out, you cut them out, or cut the skin off and yeah. Kind of like, a pine, like a pineapple. Yeah, oh yeah. Actually, you can squeeze the food. Yeah. They're kind of like a, a puppy food. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Yeah. You want to germinate the from one of the uh, yellow dragon fruit and just uh, clean the pulp off of them and plant them? Yep. It's easily done. Yep. Okay. Good. Definitely. Just like you do any of your other fresh fruit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of variety, like I said earlier, depending on their ancestors. Um, with the stem margins, they can be smooth, they can be deep and low. Tall. Some of them are, are grow very upright and they're easy to develop. Others, they're very pendant and they hang down quite a bit. There are those that are ones that lend themselves up to being in a basket or up on a shelf. Um, they can be uh, thin or thick uh, and they can have different um, uh, shapes. Uh, I, you can see cylindrical, five, four, three, flat, all the different kinds of growth that you can see cross sections on the same plant. Because their ancestry is so crazy mixed that you don't, and people go, What do I have? It's like, Oh, yeah. You know, if, if, you, if you lost the name tag, their siblings are really, really hard to identify without your name tag. Just like a so, if any of you take one of these uh, cuttings here tonight, um, typically uh, some of these pieces are fairly long. Like this one here, I cut this one down into about three, three, three pieces. Three, 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 three. And that way you've got more aerials on the ground because your new your rooting is going to come from those aerials, possibly from the bottom of the stem. But and the aerial, if you're, if you're wondering if it's upside down or right side up or whatever, aerials up. The aerials kind of point up. But if you happen to root it wrong side, it will right itself. The growth will come out of it correct. And you'll have one stem that's upside down and everything else. <laughs> so, okay. People get freaked out when it's like, I put it in this thing now. So, so figure yourself out. Um, and so, <laughs> so you've got, um, so th this is from a plant that I had. And so we typically tell you, you know, we want to piece about the like, length of the dollar bill. That's just about six inches, six, seven inches or so. And that's pretty good, especially if you've got some good aerials, like that, that haven't bloomed already. So if they've already bloomed, they probably won't put out roots very good. Um, when you're propagating, you want to let callus, uh, cutting callus for a couple of weeks. Here, we're so dry, I would take my cuttings and callus them in a cool, dark place. Because I left a couple out on the, on, the, on the patio, and they started to dry up on me. In fact, I brought one with me, you probably don't want it, because I get to looking at it, and it's like, oh my god. Um, and I've grown these here before. I have my mother's four plants. I've been hauling around the country with me for years. I never got them to bloom. But now I know why. Um, but but I, so I have these plants and, and I can grow them here. I just couldn't grow them to bloom. So I'll talk about that. Uh, so you want to plant one to two, maybe three cats down to two more if you have them, of the same variety in the same pot. If you mix varieties, like I've got one here, this is pronghorn, and I've got gray fan in the box. I put gray fan and, and pronghorn in the same box together. They grow at different rates. And one will start to outgrow the other one. It may take a few years, but eventually you're going to outgrow. One is going to be more aggressive than the other. And you potentially are going to lose that one. You don't care, you don't care. Like this one down here I brought, it's a mystery pot. Things broke when I was transporting things over here. 
I just started sticking them in soil. I didn't know what they were because they came up higher from the truck. So that is a mystery pot. Lord knows what's in there. You can drink, break that all apart and make it into a whole bunch of different plants and then see what you get. Some of them may be the same. There's two in there that are labeled mom, and that's because that's my mom's pink one. <laughs> you know, so anyway. And I don't know what that one was. Um, so you want to plant them in perlite, um, or you can water root them, you can try to water root them, but I think that's a little dangerous because they rot. They tend to, tend to rot if you're not careful that way. Um, but typically you put them in the pot, you don't water them, and you don't um, do anything with them except let them sit in the dry soil until they root. And this one I put in there in January, and I get these, that's pretty good in there. And so that works out really good. So that's my test. When I pull on it and I know it's rooted, then I start watering it. I don't water it until I make sure they get rooted. Um, if you water too soon, it can rot. If you think it's rotting, either from the top down or the bottom up, you pull it up out of the soil, cut off the rotted spot, let it callus again, and try again. I've got one in a pot right now that's got this much left. <laughs> and it's got new growth on it, so I think it might wait. How yeah. long do you do this? Uh, probably every day. Yeah, well, in the summertime, definitely. I give them a spritz every day. So how much? Just enough to kind of get the the stem kind of moist. You know, not you know, you don't want to soak it because you don't want to get the soil too wet. You know, because then you're adding potential for rot. Um, so it can take about three years, give or take, until you get a bloom. And it's, yeah, some people get them a couple of years. Sometimes there's um, an aerial that had the hormones already sending the message to it and you'll get a bloom on a cutting that's not rooted. Most people suggest taking that blossom off because you want the energy to go into the roots, not the blossom. I just never do that. I just don't leave the full blossom or just I wouldn't do it. Um, but you know it, it's up to you whether or not you do that. But but that's not because the plant is a, such a great grower. It's because it already had that hormonal message sent to the aerial while it was still on what we call the mother plant. After it's been for yeah. um, You want to grow them in dappled or indirect light. Um, and this is about a one year. This is like this is long new growth. And they get a little red on the edges. And this is under shade a uh, shade pot. Um, How start. much shade pot? 30%, 60%? Here I do 60 plus. I would I would err on the side of heavier than lighter. Um, and then uh, and then and then you can the, the good thing here on this plant is that I'm getting my new growth from below the line of the surface. So it's rooted from below where I planted it. Sometimes you'll get them that they will send out a shoot of new growth from here and here, all those rabbit ears. You can either let them keep growing and see if they last or cut them off and stick them in the ground and or stick them in the soil and, and kind of Fill out the pot that way. So um, these are the basics. You need good air circulation, dappled or indirect light. Uh, plants in too much shade though don't bloom. If you get them too dark, they want they want especially they like morning light. They like gentle morning light. Um, or late afternoon, kind of late when the sun is kind of far off in the sky. But if you have them in direct sun, they will burn. They can get used to it slowly over time, more sun, but then they get really washed out and kind of yellow a little bit, and it don't look as healthy. But indirect or dappled by steps, and you want to water them well. They need a good supply of water. You don't want the root ball to dry out. And that's why I think I'm crazy to have 200 plants here, because I'm going to be watering plants all summer long. That's all I'm going to be doing. So I have a feeling that over time I'll be bringing in plants here to share with you all. <laughs> because. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I'll be bringing him into the sale just because I will have decided I can't keep that thing. Um, nutrient wise, slow, steady release of nutrients in your soil. With any cactus, if you don't fertilize it, you're probably not going to get a bloom at that point, in my experience. Um, best potting soil for these is something that should contain some organic matter, have a slight acidic pH, and be porous and well drained. And um, you want a well developed root system to promote blooming. A lot of people say they have to be root down. They don't need to necessarily be root down, they just need to be sure, healthy roots. You were talking about fertilizing annually. What about fertilizing every time you water with a current? Exactly. Yeah, we, we 
you say weekly, weekly. Um, and I and I said that, that that's coming here. Okay. Uh, but temperature for um, ideal for growing these is 50 to 80 to 80 degrees. So they don't like it too much colder than that, and they don't like it too much hotter than that. So that's why the ones that I have left in my greenhouse. I mean, they, I, I broke my ankle and I couldn't get up to the greenhouse. So I was sending my husband up there every day to water my plants. So, but but it's like they were they were they were they need more air. They need they need less less intense heat right around them. So uh, when will it bloom? When your roots are mature and crowded in the pot, it has some second season growth. Uh, most of these will bloom in the spring. There are small season bloomers though. It will bloom in the fall or any, any time of year. I've got one plant that will throw out a bloom like almost any time of year. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And a few, like I said, a few flowers throughout the year. Um, fertilizing. Um, typically, we we promote or we, we tell folks that there's like two fertilizing periods. The first one is in late, that I adjusted this for New Mexico. In, in San Diego, I was starting to fertilize in early January. Here, you're going to wait until probably late February. Um, going to give it some uh, something that promotes blooming. Actually, a balanced fertilizer is just fine, but a lot of people swear by using a low nitrogen fertilizer because it's got more phosphorus, more potassium, especially the phosphorus. Um, and that promotes blooming. Uh, and then June to September, you're going to uh, fertilize to promote growth after blooming and recovery. Because some of these get real stressed after blooming, especially if they put out a lot of them. Yes? How often do you water in the wintertime? Almost, I mean, yeah, 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 that's coming, but very little. Okay. Very, very little. You see, they kind of they need that stress. Um, and then liquid or granular, if you're going to use a liquid fertilizer, like you said, wheat, weekly. Um, something maybe a half strength, maybe even with less strength than that. Um, and uh, every third watering or so during the growing season, half strength or weaker. Um, and or I, I had so many and I still have quite a few, so I'm probably just gonna use granular because I just like one and done and throw it in there and I don't have anything else. Who do you can use a trash can? You can mix it the trash can. Yeah, and get your sprayer out. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing. And then there was the winter time, you don't fertilize. You let them go dormant as much dormancy as they have. They might go a little bit more in the winter, but for the most part, unless they're in a greenhouse where your temperature is fully controlled, they're not going to grow in the wintertime. Um, other things that stimulate flowers is the for probably the more on too long. Um, the what, what also stimulates the for growth or for blooming is what we call vernalization when it, with low uh, low temperatures. And if you're keeping these in a greenhouse at a constant temperature, you may not get enough of a stressor on the plant to make it want to bloom. And the blooming is what a plant does when it's thinking it's going to die, if, you know, in a way, it's wanting to reproduce and to perpetuate itself. So the chill hours is part of the dormancy thing. You can't let it freeze, but you want to let it get cool. And that's why I tell you if you Hear about people talking about their Christmas tactics and how they kind of put it in a dark, cool room to get it to bloom, to get it to make love. These they're kind of the same way in a lot of ways. And uh, and so this goes along with the idea that stress also regulates flowering. And in empathetic cacti, the stress may also be a factor in the fact that their ancestry is used to dry and wet seasonality. So in our in our winters, we cut way back on the watering. And we get it in a cool place and we don't water them very much. You don't want the roof all go to completely dry out. So during the winter time, you're maybe watering them if you've got them in the garage or you've got them in a greenhouse, you're watering them maybe once a month. Um, maybe two times a month if your greenhouse is a warm greenhouse. But you want, you're want you going to cut back on watering. If you water them and you bring them in the house, they're a happy plant. They don't need the flower. You're, you're taking care of them. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you take them into the, the typical garage in the wintertime here, I mean, sometimes the temperature will drop between 30 and 40. Or 40. I had to turn the heater on in my garage last oh, one last a couple times because okay. yeah, yeah. I didn't want it to get down below like 35. <laughs> um, but but yeah, if if, uh, if you've got it in the green in the garage, that's a great cool spot to, to put them for the wintertime if you if you can be sure that your temperature is going to stay up to 30. Even though it's essentially dark 24 7. Well, that's it. You need grow light. 
that you're going to do that. You've got to add some grow light. I've got a big window in my garage because it's part of the workshop, so I get light in there. So that, that can be okay. And the thing that I don't think has a lot to do with these kind of is the photoperiodic flowering, where the length of the day and the night matter. That doesn't seem to have anything to do with these. They come from the tropics. You know, that's like, you know, pretty much equal day and night. So that's not, that's not something that these plants, you know, I care about. Um, so after blooming, I said you, you fertilize for growth and recovery, balance fertilizer when they're recovering. Um, you can use a foliar spray too. I mean, that's, that's a possibility. And as far as feeding them, um, fertilizer, yes, that's usually enough, but I do add some more casting. Um, I know people that use bone meal, blood meal, um, any number of other things just to give it some, you know, whatever you typically do to give the plant some extra nutrition. Soil well draining and porous, slightly acidic. Replace it every five or seven years. They're about, I have some that have been in pots a lot longer than that, but I just make sure I put my bones more than once. If it's there, and if they get big, like, oh, I don't know. But, um, but typically here, I'm going to keep my stuff in like a gallon size because I, I got to schlep them in and out all the time, like winter, summer, back and forth. So I'm going to keep them in very small pots. But in San Diego, I had a couple that were in pots that were this huge, so I couldn't do it. Um, the azalea chameleon mix is something that I use because it's, it's a fairly acidic mix. Um, but my, my basic mix that I use is potting soil, fertilite, and small orchid bark. That gives you a few organic, a little bit organic. Fertilite helps with the drainage. And if you use cactus mix, which is perfectly fine, if I if I was using cactus mix, and I sometimes throw that in, um, I would add fertilite one to one, half fertilite, half cactus. Because cactus has got sand in it, and it should tend to be a little heavier, pack a little bit more, and you want this to be fairly free flowing, well draining mix. And um, in a dry desert region. You might consider adding some pumice or some vermiculite, something I would never do in San Diego because it's too people too wet. But here you might have something like that to put some more moisture in so then, or to keep more moisture in it. And why acidic acidity? It's because these amps and their ancestry is tropical. And soils are acidic due to high rainfall. And that comes from the tropics. So soil acidification occurs when you have hydrogen cations that build up in the soil. And you want to, um, you know, reduce the soil pH as much as you can. But really, it doesn't matter. We fertilize them. We take care of them. You know, it, it, I, people get all yanged out about, like, I got to add an acid to it. I got to make it more acidic. You know, I've never worried about it. But it's something that we, we tell people, and then they kind of focus on that. And, and it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's just that's the environment they come from. Yeah. You acidify your water. I I don't think not here. No. You mean like a water softener type thing, or no? Oh no, I oh vinegar. No, I've never done that. It might it might help. You might experiment with that if you feel like it. But it but it doesn't seem to be so essential that if you don't do it, you have lots of stuff. It sort of it ends on your water source. Sometimes the water sources around here are very helpful. Right, and and that was true of my of my water in San Diego because all of our water there comes from somewhere else, and the salt content, the sodium content, is really high. So it's it's really helpful in other ways as well. Here, if you don't if you don't acidify the water, you can make it acidic soil, but it won't stay acidic for very long at all. Exactly. Yeah, and that's that, that's the same thing in, in the, the Midwest. My experience there in, in Southern California, same idea, same idea. Um, and now from here on out, uh, it's, we get more more pretty pictures of flowers. Um, these are two that I uh, that I've grown: Argus and Ambrosia. And that's how we, how you get into it. It's like you go you go to the the meeting and see these pretty pictures up, and I start making lists of the ones that I want, <laughs> and then I find them. Um, oh, here's a couple of things about um, seasonal here. Um, and we just, we talked about some of this already. Uh, cold, freezing nights, maybe followed by warm days. You know, we've got our, our temperatures can go really way up, way down. And you've got to kind of just got to be cognizant of that because you kind of have. Um, the summer monsoons can create 
swings in humidity, and if it gets too easy, we get too wet for the experience, these can be more prone to rot. So you kind of got to watch them. I've got a couple in the greenhouse right now, and I'm thinking, well, I don't know if you're going to it. And I think, it, and there are some of the more delicate ones. I think these these heavier stemmed ones, I think, will be much better here than some of the more delicate ones. I think that's what I'm thinking. Um, soil moisture is inadequate. Uh, if you don't have enough soil moisture, the thing is uh, really uh, an issue for us here is going to be high winds. Because especially in the springtime, when you start putting these plants out, you're going to have to watch them because the winds can just suck the moisture out of them. And, um, you know, I'm going to be sticking my finger in that pot all the time and still checking it to see if it's got enough moisture when the, when the winds are blowing. And, and, and you don't need to be aware of your own microclimate. Albuquerque has got a number of microclimates, from being down in the Bosque to being up on the West Mesa to being you know, in the foothills. You're going to have different experiences in different places. Because like I said earlier, sometimes you got to move the plant around and find the right place. But always with that downward shape. Um, a breeze will kill them, um, causes the stems to turn black and mushy. And uh, if the roots don't all freeze, sometimes the plants will come back. But typically, if you get a breeze and necrosis, that then your plants are Um, Epi soap can tolerate some food temperatures. They can to tolerate a couple of hours down your freezer. So if we're going to have that one of those kind of nights, but I remember when we lived here in 2011, there was a February in 2011, it got down to 15, that over after where you lived on the west side. You know, I'd be hauling everything in, and they, I'd be out sitting in the greenhouse washing the temperature. But um, but a prolonged mild freeze or a brief hard freeze can kill it too. So if all of a sudden it drops to 25 one night and you weren't prepared for it, you're probably going to lose a lot of your time. Um, so you want to protect them from frost. This is a greenhouse in Germany, um, and this uh, is it. So you can you can grow these quite successfully in a greenhouse environment. Um, green plants inside mid to late October when the nights start to cool and the temperatures start dipping down into the 40s. Because all of a sudden we can have a full plant when that starts to happen. Um, winter storage, you want to select a location where your plants are not going to freeze, or you can control the, the temperatures. Um, the garage, an attic, a basement, a greenhouse, they all have different challenges, but you need to have them in somewhere where you can. Um, and, but conversely, like I said, 50 to 80 degrees, you start getting high temperatures, you got to kind of compensate for that too. Um, roots should never get completely dry. Water in the morning before the hottest part of the day, that's, that's kind of new to that here anyway. Um, dry desert like conditions, you might want to consider using a mister, but then you got to kind of be careful that you don't get it too wet and too humid. Um, not that that's probably a, a problem here, but. Um, they should tolerate heat if you have enough humidity, but not too much humidity. I mean, it's just balancing. Um, so maybe these are too fuzzy. I don't know. Like you have to make that decision. Um, create you need to create like the microclimate or deal with the microclimate that you have. Um, you can grow from seed, hybridizing. This is this is an heavy fruit right here, cut in half. You can eat it or you can grow it. Um, one seed can produce a wide array of offspring. And of course, the hybridizers choose characteristics that they want to see these seeds to flower. And some, and some hybridizers, before they register a plant, it'll be five, seven, ten years because the flower doesn't bloom exactly the same every year when it first starts to bloom. So you've got to see it bloom for several years so it's a stable bloom, and then you register. So hybridizers, it's a long-term commitment on any. Um, and this is the difference in the in the in the seed, just to kind of show you everything from the dragon fruit down to a plumber zero and a holiday package for some stuff. And then of course we'll get off it. Um and this is a cross. I wanted to show you the, what, what results from a cross. Uh, here's Pegasus. Um, these two are what yeah, actually these are all three of my plants. Um, not my cross. This, cross. this is a plant pegasus that was registered in 1949. Uh, the hybridizer in this case crossed it with orange bowl, a flower from 1979. And somewhere in that time period, after 1979, the, he created wild thing. And um, that uh, was registered in 1997. And in some cases, we know the ancestry, 
we can go back a ways and see what their genealogy is, so to speak. But in other cases, there is no cross with the Pegasus, but it's one of our older hybrids. And it's, it's a really good grower, but we don't know what it's crossed with. So once you get back a ways, you have no idea what they're doing with the part that's um, here's, here, here's this is an interesting one. Um, this uh, gentleman, uh, whose name is George French, he was in San Diego. He was a prolific hybridizer. He uh, registered almost 400 hybrids during his time period when he was hybridizing. He passed away in 2009. Um, but um, this cross between this plant called Crown and Lady Ruffles, who crossed these two, and he got 45 different flowers. And this was the variety of flowers that he produced with this. And these are just 22 of the 45 that he registered from this cross. Where does the yellow come from? Somewhere in his ancestry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, each seed would be a different color. So but but all of those seeds came from the same seed plot. Um, and just a quick note on pests. Same thing that say you get on all the stuff that you grow already. That they're very, very commonly, you know, it's like aphids, mealy bugs, snails are the bane of my existence. Uh, caterpillars. I'm always fighting on I see the little white cabbage moths. So that means they'll decimate and have to stand overnight. I mean, they love those things. Um, we don't get root weevils too much. Grasshoppers will eat them. Um, and then we have the same things that you have on, on other desert other cactus. You get corking. You get um, maybe not so much some of these other things. Edema, where it's kind of like spotty. They get spotty sometimes. Um, fungal leaf spots, spot bacteria, they're, they're subject to viruses. Um, so, you know, the, the best thing to do when you're growing out these is to make sure you sterilize your tools and you keep them as clean as you can because then you're not going to have to And if you have a big collection, that's really good. Um, a couple things about species. Um, let's see. Uh, here is Epiphyllum superi. This is what I have. I think I brought a piece of this variety with me. Um, so the plant is small that I have now. I should all have more. It's a nice bloomer. This one lasts a little while into the next day. It'll stick around until about noon the next day and then it's gone. Nice blooming and fragrant. So this is the oxytetal one. This one I, I put up here because this is kind of a cool story. Um, this is the way it should look. This is a sport. This is a, a, a mutation that has a stable mutation. If you've got a cutting from this plant, and I have some cuttings from this plant in my box, um, Mark Twain, this one will bloom this way. It will not revert back to this. Oh my, but it should stay this. This fork has been, been cultivated and propagated and passed around in its outfit. The story goes is that it was discovered in Samuel Clemens Conservatory, Connecticut, and that it may very well have originated there. And then a woman in Los Angeles registered. So and Dan gave it the name Mark Twain because the story was that it came from Samuel Summers' Conservatory. So, so whether or not it did, it's a But um, so we don't know that for sure. But that's what the story is. And its name is called Mark Twain. This one is Pumalum. I brought, I brought a piece of Pumalum with me. It's a small white um, night blooming one. Um, this one is a is a another mutation. This one is uh, is uh, what people call it curly sue because of the the, the stems are all the stems are all curly. And this is the flower that it gets. These things and, and this one is so fruitful. This one fruits every time it blooms. And it's a little teeny one. The flower is only about this big, and it's not very good smelling. Most of these smell wonderful, but this one is kind of musty. It's not yet for whatever pollinator it attracts, but it, it, it gets, but it, or maybe it doesn't really need pollen because it does, it does poop. And uh, anyway, that's the uh, Guatemala monster. Uh, this one, um, I brought, oh, that, that's this one here. That's how rooted. This is, um, that's a cactus granatus, plus species granatus, variety chichi, name goes. <laughs> And it's got this really, even if it never bloomed, I love the growth on this thing. It's got this uneven, low growth that if you see this, you know it's just got the 
It's very distinct, very, and some of these are very distinct. You can tell what they are. Others, you can tell you can know. But this is one you can always tell. Um, Connie Meyer, this is a dragon fruit cross that I have. I sure I'll have cuttings with this one available. Um, it grows like a weed, and then I had to off of this one. Um, this is the Ripsilla. You're talking about the little teeny tiny flower. This is the Ripsilla, and this is the flower. That's how big it is. It's, uh, it's like two, what, two centimeters, two, two centimeters wide. So, but it this thing that it, it, it's just amazing. This is called Ripsilla um, paradoxa. And my yard blooming, that's up and a picture from the internet that gave away my rock cutting. Um, this is Mesembrian Yomoidi. I have to watch that. I have to look at that one to say. Um, this one is supposedly not available in the wild anymore. It's supposedly um, died off in the wild and it's only available in fish. This house Pylocarpa. My, my Pylocarpa sound is cutting stuff. This is stuff carpa. I'll have more another time. Um, and this is the fruit on one of those. Uh, Lepismium, or Lepismium, Warminianum. Again, these are teeny flowers. These are, these are little flowers. These flowers are like, you know, like less than an inch big. This, these are also real tiny flowers. This is Pfeiffer Monsanto. This one is a, a, a Pfeiffer uh, species, or a genus species cross, uh, cross with an epi. This one's real controversial because nobody, not everybody agrees that this is real, that this is a real thing. That, that, they, that they were actually able to cross the fibro with the, with the epi uh, fibers. But the thing is, it's only about that big around. It's cool. I've been on growing some of this, but it's just cutting for me now. Uh, a couple, uh, say a couple things about holiday cactus. Should I keep going or are we? Just a couple things about holiday cactus. There is a way to tell them apart. So one with the very smooth edges. This is the true old-fashioned Christmas cactus. This is the Slumber Hero of Bethlehem. It is a cross between two of the early ones that were brought over in the 1800s. And this one is the one that you see growing in your great grandmother or grandmother's solarium with the big huge thing that breaks down and it's the Christmas cat. Nowadays though in the stores you mostly see this one. This is the truncata group hybrid. This is what is originally marketed as Thanksgiving cat because they bloom a little bit earlier. They have slowly replaced the Christmas cactuses in the stores. Because they're easier to transport because they grow upright, so you can wrap them in the paper and get them to the stores without breakage. And they bloom earlier, so they're already blooming before Christmas. The true Christmas or Christmas cactus, this one doesn't start blooming until late December. So it, 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 it's fallen out of favor with the marketing people, the commercial side of things. And I have cuttings of this that I finally found. I had to get it from somebody who got it from their grandmother, got it from their grandmother, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to grow this one. So most of the ones you see in the stores are what in, in Great Britain they call these um, crab cactus. And, and then this is the Easter cactus. And if you look at this picture with better, you would see on the very tip of this, it's got a boatload of hairs right down here. Otherwise, it looks very similar to the um, Christmas cactus. Just for want of a general thing. But so the stem segment shape can tell you which one you have. But most of the ones you see in the store are some kind of a cross that produce this kind of upright growing holiday before Christmas blooming type chat. Um, and there's there's eight species of um Pumperdura. They're from Brazil. Um, most of the crosses that you see in the stores are these top three. And the Trum Trumpata oriciana is where nowadays you see these very exotic looking ones. That's been bred into these now, and this one was discovered I think in the 1970s finally, and was added to these so you get you get more variety of of, uh, of look. These other ones aren't are used too much in hybrid, which area is a little bit of this picture. Um, and this is the, the, how they look different. 
you see here that the Christmas cap is very much hangs down, very pendant, easily breaks. And the, um, this one is the truncata with the more upright. You can still grow the basket hanging down, but it tends to be more upright, especially as a, as a young plant. And here's a few that I have in my, my collection. Decompose. There's a, there's a yellow in this now. There is no yellow though in the Eastern Catholic. These are her salad options. And there's only a pink and a red. And that's all they really had to work with, although they've done more experimenting with them, all the chemicals here and there, and then not. And nowadays you can get some different ones in the Eastern Catholic as well. So, but there is no yellow down the road now in the Eastern Catholic show. And just to go through real quick, we know our pictures of some of mine. Camilla Obayashi. This guy, uh, Derek Obayashi, he bred all these and he didn't come off through all of the channels. <laughs> Delicate jewels and little hills. I don't know. Calisco Grace, the, the German hybridized soldier by the name of um, Rudolf Huffing Hart, and he makes some gorgeous plants. Um, George's Triumph, Kiwi pineapple goods. There's a bunch of these that have kiwi in the name. They're from New Zealand. So the president said, oh, I'm, I mean, I'm a minor not doing so well. I'm thinking maybe where they came from where it's a little more sterile cooler. They may not be so well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But we retired here. Do I have to <laughs> try to make the tour? George's favorite. I love this kind of little teeny tiny one. You see, you see the blossom up here. And then, what are we? Kitty Cat. <laughs> Alexander <laughs> Ernest Estrada. Another guy that names them all after his family members. He's a really sweet man, but he names them with a crazy long name. Well, not crazy name, it's long. Um, Astro de Oro. Can't say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I bought this one. I bought it from a guy that swapped me 50 hybridized it. It's not registered, but I love it. So let's go Queen. This is another one of Rudolph. Do all the crystals look like an eye? Oh, yeah. Characteristic. Characteristic, yeah. Thank you very much. A little bit different here. This is a little split. Couple white, plus four, and Alvarado, Mia Chase, Nocturne. And sometimes the, some of the um, uh, the uh, anthers are purple on some of these. Just like they get crossed with Professor Beezer. Vanilla Sunset. This is the one that just blooms at any time of year. Kiwi Ravalella, one of those in Wonders. Where are the uh, anthers coming from? They're coming from the green and the bottom part of the grass. Yes, yes. I have, I have, I have a, what's that change? Easter Island. See? Yeah. Oh. If you look at the top of the top of the top of the top of the Yeah. Yeah. And what was, you which is why, yeah. And that was something I don't know. Frida, Frida Kahlo with the ruffles, and she's growing right next to Diego Rivera. Oh, no. No. Get her away from me. No, I've got my like green out right next to each other. King Midas. And this King Midas is cool. Some years it's grown, it comes out really deep orange, and other years it's almost peach. So, it's kind of depends on what's going on. Once you go, it's kind of a focus. The red. And Zeus, this is that big brick that Oh, yeah. And pronghorn. Oh, that's what's in this little pot. This broke off. And like I said, it's got air roots. And I put it in the pot, I think, like last week. And I, I'm already doing a tub. So it's this weird pot. But it's really teeny. And uh, let's see. Oh, this one's Sunland. I can see when your name is covering up Sunland. No. Uh, Beauty Queen. Oh, Christmas bells and Merry Christmas to the two small ones. Radiant fire. That's a lot of us. 
Tropical treasure. There's a couple of cuttings of that in there. Carol Snabel. And if you don't know what they are, they're still free. And some people call them no IDs or noise, and other people yeah. call them unks or unknown. But <laughs> if, if you don't care about the name, and just throw your own for your annoyed and happy because of the and those were ones that I didn't know what the names were, but I still throw them. No. And now this is not yeah, or any other name. And uh and here's my ah. here's my dragon fruit with the image of this. Oh. Are there any variegated types of pesticides and Not not that I'm aware of. A lot of the ones that um that have like variegated flowers are suspected to be virus. To have an actual virus. Um, but not, I mean, stem. The stem, not that I've ever seen. Yeah. And, and if you have that going on, you probably got an iron deficiency or something like that going on. Because there's no true variegated one that I've ever seen. Oh. Anyway, that's it. Thank you.